life comes in different seasons. I embrace change. And while it adds value to my life, I also need some kind of a vision. Like, where am I going? What is my guide? The Bible reassures me. God's word never changes. You know, the rain is going to hit and feelings and opinions come and go. I mean, we live in an unstable world. God talks to me through his word. It's like a fire that keeps me alive. Here, I can find rest and peace during all uncertainty. Studying the Bible gives me assurance every day. You might be asking, who are Seventh-day Adventists? Commonly known as Adventists, we are a Christian movement established in 1863. We have 28 fundamental beliefs and more than 20 million members. We also observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. Worldwide, we have more than 162,000 congregations. We serve countless communities with our education institutions, with two million students. And 198 hospitals around the world. And it's all because we love Jesus. All my life, I've been dealing with projects. I do a lot of research. Basically try to understand how different materials affect fires. It involves a lot of formulas and gathering data. I met this girl once in grad school and we got to talk about all kinds of things and also about God. It was great. I could share with her what I believed in. And then I got busy with my own research and realized I may have treated her like a project. Like, I kind of expected her to change herself. But people are so much more than projects. There's some kind of human connection to it. I think we're supposed to share our lives with those around us, but sometimes just being with them, being their friend, that's the best way to find true connection. And that's what witnessing is to me, relationships and friendships. In the heart of America stands the Inter-American Division. It is comprised of all of Central America, the northern parts of South America, and the islands of the Caribbean Sea. What a great diversity fills each corner of this region. Flora, fauna, culture. The strength of our church in this territory is its 3,681,066 members filled with faith, hope, and courage. Our doors are always open. Meeting in 23,319 churches and congregations, large, small, outdoors, or online, it's amazing to know that God is present in each one of them. The Inter-American Division is comprised of 24 unions, divided into 156 local conferences. We spread the message through various means, including the 35 hospitals and clinics across the territory. In its 14 universities, many young people are trained daily to serve God in different professional fields. One theological seminar prepares pastors to serve the church membership and preach the gospel across Inter-America. This is a territory with millions of school-aged children, 
790 primary and secondary schools deliver Adventist Christian education to 145,596 students through the dedicated labor of 9,879 teachers committed to serving God and humanity. Nine centers of influence work with creative ideas of evangelism to target various people groups. The gospel also travels by air and the internet. Messages of hope are shared 24-7 through television programs produced in three languages and through broadcast by more than 90 radio stations. The Inter-American Division is this and more. Every day, our church works to preach the gospel to more than 307 million residents across its territory. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This is the last Sabbath of the quarter, which means that it is 13th Sabbath. Uh, my name is Tracy Villamil. I'll be your host this morning. And my co-host is Safira Vasquez. And today we'll be looking at a little man with a big heart, right? right. Do you guys know who it is? <laughs> Right, so when we think about that little man, Zacchaeus often comes to mind, you know. But this Sabbath is a special Sabbath, again, because it's 13th Sabbath. We have a host and a bunch of kids that will be presenting and sharing their little parts with us. So um, even though we'll be talking about a little man with a big heart, that's for the sermon part, right? Yes. In, the, in the earlier in the Sabbath school, we want to discuss a little bit of how people overcome their challenges. This little man with a big heart had some problems and Jesus helped him to work it out. You know, and since we're focusing on the kids, Sister Safira, I think kids have some challenges to overcome too, right? Yes, that's right. They do. And so today, we're hoping to share some biblical counsels to help guide and to make their little wrongs right. Amen. Just like Zacchaeus did. Amen. Before we get into our program, we want to begin with a word of prayer. So I'll ask Sister Safira to pray for us. Okay, let us pray. Dear my Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks and praise for this lovely Sabbath day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies bestowed upon us, Lord, that you saw us fitting, Father God, to be here to present your word. Father God, we ask you to please meet all our viewers, open yeah. their hearts, touch them, Father God, that they can see, Father God, the amazing power that you have, the amazing restorative power that you have to change lives and to make us whole just like you are. Please meet us through the Sabbath School program Amen. and help, Father God, that your message might find a resting place in the heart of all those who are viewing. And I pray, Lord, that this message will go far and beyond what our mind can conceive. Also, Lord, in just name I pray. Amen. 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 If you're watching on Facebook, um, on YouTube, or um on channel 98, we encourage you to grab the little kids and have them sit with you because they're going to enjoy this program this morning. You know, so we want to begin with the children. So stay with us as the next voice you hear will be from the Ladyville Sinai um, and the Biscayne Praise Team. So we have the kids doing the song service this morning. Our first song will be the B I B L E. The B I B L E. Let's ask the boat for me. I stand alone in the word of God. The B I B L E. The B I B L E. Let's ask the boat for me. I stand alone in the word of God. The B I B L E. Jesus will never fail. Never fail. Never fail. Jesus will never fail. No, no, no. Jesus will never fail. Satisfied, satisfied. Jesus will satisfy. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus will come again, come again, come again. Jesus will come again. For you and me, for you and me, for you and me. God's not dead. God's not dead. No. He's alive. God's not dead. No. He's alive. God's not dead. No. He's alive. I can feel it in my hand. Feel it in my feet. Feel it. 
Welcome back to our 13th Sabbath program here on ATN. I hope the kids are excited and I hope the adults are excited too to see the big celebration that we're having for the children. We're celebrating under the team a little man with a big heart. But who is this little lady here, Sister Safira? This is Amelia. Amelia Segura, and she'll be joining us for this section of the art program today. Right. To begin, we want to talk about some challenges that our, you know, our little kids face. And so we want to talk about how hard it is to make choices. You know, just before we get into how children make choices, we want to set the pace by reading our scripture reading for this morning, which is taken from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 to 19. Yeah, and I'm going to go, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it for us. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And so we'll be using this scripture reading as a reference for some of the things that Jesus doesn't like um, that we do and that we want to be able to teach our children um, as well. All right, Sister Safira, let's, let's talk to little Amelia. Okay, so Amelia will be helping us today to, in making um, decisions, okay? Mm -hmm. So her decisions will be based on food choices. Amelia, which one would you like? Would you prefer grapes or Oreo? For grapes. Okay. Okay, and which one would you prefer? Apple or ice cream? Ice cream. <laughs> ice cream <laughs> okay so we know most kids they tend to like to eat the junk food the junk food right, right. so little Amina look like she has a nice balance though so she likes yes. grapes and she likes Oreos, Oreos that's ice cream I, ice cream yes ice grapes cream and ice cream right mm -hmm. so our first virtue principle that we'll be dealing with today do you want to hold this up for me Amelia? Mm -hmm. hold it up for me is 
a healthy mind and body. Can you say that? Healthy mind and body. Healthy mind and body. Amen. Okay. Amen. Healthy She's, mind and body. So cute. You know, um, little children probably think that when we tell them about what foods to eat, that it's just from the parents that we just want to control them. But you know, the Bible also has something to say about what we should eat, you know. So let's go to the Bible, Sister Safira. Um, is there a verse you think that you could share with Amelia that can encourage her, you know, that Jesus also wants us to be healthy? It's not just you know, something that your parents do because they don't want you to have fun. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can look at 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. Mm -hmm. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So your body is, temp is temple of the? Yes. Holy Spirit, say it. Holy Spirit. Spirit, yes. <laughs> you are called to honor God with your whole body, right? So... Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. Mm -hmm. So who do you belong to? To God. Amen. That's right. We belong to God. I think that's a huge lesson for us too as adults. Sometimes we forget that we don't belong to ourselves, that what we put into our body is a reflection of our spiritual relationship with God. And the sooner we learn this, especially as young kids growing up, the most easier it will be as adults. It's going to be second nature for us. It'll be first nature for us to eat properly, and that's going to help mm -hmm. us with our spiritual relationship. I like, um, I like what it says um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. It says, Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Mm. You know, God was specific when he said what will be on the face of the earth for us to use as food. He never said chicken. He never said, you know, um, Oreos. He never said ice cream and a lot of cheese. But everything he mentioned, it goes back to seed-bearing plants yes. and every tree that has fruits with seed in it. You know, so when we have to make choices, we want to remember that God already has a plan in place. And if we the stick to that plan. Uh, original plan, if we stick to that, we're going to have healthy life. You know, he said, beloved, I wish that you would prosper and be healthy above all things. And we want to teach our little children that. Yes, and also remember 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink mm -hmm. or whatever you do, it says do it all for the glory of God. So when we eat and when we drink, we should do it all to the glory of God, right? Remember that we belong to God both physically and spiritually, right? So when we take care of our physical body, it helps us to have a clear mind that we can think and we can better be of service to God. All right. Amen. I love that you said that because when you said that, it reminded me of worship. That we, whatever you do, do it unto God. So even when we eat, is a form of worship that we can use to show that we serve the true and living God with what we eat, you know, by the temples that we're trying to protect. So what we eat, our diet, is an opportunity for us to show who we worship and to worship God in spirit and truth. All right, Sister so, Sal, so, so. let's, okay. um, let's challenge the, the, the kids. Yes. I, I don't know what you have in mind, but let's put them to the test. Yes, so we have a challenge for you guys when it comes to making food choices. And the challenge is that you're to make a list of all the food that you eat in a day or a week, mm -hmm. how much of it is healthy. So when you already write down the list of foods that you eat, you're going to determine or mark which one is healthy and which one is not. And the challenge is for you to replace one kind of junk food with a healthy choice for one week. So if you know you like to eat Oreos every day, then you're going to replace it with a banana or an apple, right? So this is your challenge that you will do. Man, we, want to, we want the adults to try this challenge because it's not so easy to do. I said... All right, no pastry, no flour and sugar for the week. 
my goodness that was so hard no flour and sugar for the whole week that was really hard so i challenge our adults to um, take out this task as well you know that's our first you know how to make decisions when we come back we look at some other hard choices to make but we can overcome it with jesus when we come back we're gonna have a special from the james garbot primary school and then we'll have our lesson study by the juniors class that will be led by sister gail dominguez Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath and welcome to our lesson study session of our Sabbath program here on ATN. We're so happy that you have joined us. And this morning with me, I have three special guests coming all the way from Biscayne Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome. You want to introduce yourself? Tell us your name. My name is Jairus. And you are? Joel Seguro. And Jace Ruiz. And Jace Ruiz. All right. Mr. Ruiz and Ms. Segura, we are thankful that you guys accepted the invitation to come and discuss the PowerPoint lesson with us this morning. Um, our topic, what is our topic or the team for our lesson this week? Who wants to share that with us? Live man walking. Live man walking. Ms. Segura, would you like to share with us our memory text? Yes, sir. Or our power text as it's called in your quarterly. First Peter 1 to 3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Amen. Over this coming weekend, the world will be celebrating the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But us as Christians, we celebrate that what? Every day, right? Every day we celebrate his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The fact that Jesus came into this world, that he died, and he is risen gives us hope. It gives us hope. It gives us hope that there is victory over death, and that one day we can live eternally with him. What do you say about that? Amen. You say amen, amen, all right? So let's start off our discussion this morning with a difficult question. Let me ask you this. Have any of you ever lost someone you love? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. yes. yes. So all of you have lost someone you love. Let me ask you, how did that make you feel? Hopeless. It made you feel hopeless. Do you ever long to see that person, to talk to that person, to hug that person? Definitely. Yes, you do. All of us do. We long to talk to that person again. And losing that loved one, how, um, what kind of emotions it, 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 it brought on you when you lost that loved one? Depression and sadness. You felt depressed. You felt sadness. Whenever we lose a loved one, it leaves us hopeless. It leaves us broken hearted. But I want to say to you that there is hope. There is hope. The lesson that we will discuss today will tell us why there is hope. So before we go into our discussion, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear King, I must send Father God, I thank you for bringing us out here today, dear God. Please help us, please guide us, dear God. You see and you know the problems that everyone of us. Every one of us is having right now, dear God. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. 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 All right. Live man walking. That is our topic for this morning's lesson review. And we want to start off our story. We want to start off our story. We want to know about this live man walking. Share with us, Chase. Well, Jesus was, Jesus was accused of wrongdoing okay. and just was sent before a conscious pilot and a conscious pilot sentenced him to crucifixion on the cross at Gilgal or the place of skulls. All right, right? So at Galgota, they sentenced Jesus to death. He didn't do anything wrong. He was accused, like you said. And the crowd, they brought two, pers um, two persons before the crowd. They brought um, Barabbas and they brought Jesus. And they asked who do you want? Do you want Barabbas or do you want Jesus? And the crowd chose Barabbas and they said, what do you want us to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They wanted him to die on a cross. And like you said, they took him there on um, Galgota and they nailed him to a cross. He was there nailed to a cross. Now imagine this, the savior of the world that you, Jair, that you have waited for for so long. Now you are at the cross and you see him there hanging and now he is dead. What's going through your mind? Hopeless. Hopeless. This is the end. All right? The person that I thought would rescue us, the person that I thought had all this power is now laying there. You're thinking to yourself what? Uh, I would say to myself that I guess, I guess it's, over, it's over now. It's over now. Why don't he doesn't get off this cross, right? If he is God and he has all this power, why doesn't he just come down? And if you were Jesus, what would you have done with all those people nailing you to the cross? Um, that's, a good question. that's a good question, right? In our human strength, you would want to say, God, just use the power, just snap your finger and make all the people drop down or show these people that you are God. But that's not what he did. That's not what he did. So we're here now at the cross at Calvary. Jesus is on the cross. He's nailed to the cross. He is now dead. What happens next in our story? Well, next, Mary was walking with her spices because that's what they used to cleanse and help the, prepare the body for the burial. Okay. And she met Joanna, and they went, to the, and they went together to the tomb. Okay. And when they got there and they looked inside of the tomb, Jesus was gone. He was gone. The sheets folded nicely on the bed, on the on the stone, and he was gone. So Jesus was gone. Now here, came, here comes these two women. They're walking, they're going, they're already sad, all right? They're going towards Jesus' tomb. Um, they have all their spices and all their ointment that they need to, um, to prepare Jesus' body, like you said, for burial. But now you come, and the first thing you see is the stone rolled away. So now something happened. The stone is rolled away. And when you look into that grave, you see nobody. So you're standing there, the stone is all away, and where is my savior? What would you have thought? You have thought, you have, you, what would have come to your mind that what? Someone took him. Somebody stole his body. What would they want with Jesus' body? Somebody stole his body. Now he is already, you, he died, all right? And you're already feeling hopeless, and now you come to anoint his body, and you don't see his body there. You are thinking to your mind, where is Jesus? Where is his body? What have they done to Jesus? Now, what, what happens after that in the story? Tell me what happens after that in the story. 
Mary Magdalene returned to the tomb quietly weeping. His body is gone. All right, so before we go there, we have a, a part of the story before that, before Mary Magdalene. What happened? One of the angels said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. All right, so here we go. So we have here now Mary. We have Mary Magdalene. We have Mary and we have... um. Uh -huh. um, we have Joanna. So tell us about that part of the story with Mary and Joanna. The Mary and Joanna? All right. Who has the part of the story with Mary and Joanna? When the angel appeared to Mary and Joanna. Okay. Now we have the two women at the tomb. The tomb is empty. They don't see Jesus' body there. What happens next? Suddenly the tomb was filled with light as two angels in gleaming clothes appeared. One of the angels said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. The other angel added, Remember how he told you while he was, while, while he was with you in, in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over the hands of sinners, be crucified, on, and on the third day he will be risen. Amen. Amen. I say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now we have these two men. They had forgotten the promise of Jesus. Jesus already told them, right, that he was going to die and that he would be risen in three days. Now, they are there. They're sad. When somebody dies, like you guys said, they're sad. you're sad. You're brokenhearted. You feel hopeless. So here come these women. Jesus' body is not here. And then you stood there and you saw an empty tomb filled with light and you saw two beings Looking like an angel appeared to you. What would you have done? Tell me what you would have done, Jair. I'm frightened. You may have frightened, right? You have gotten scared. What would you have done? I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would have done the same thing. I would have said, what? Angels? We've never seen angels. We only hear about them. We only see stories, right? And pictures of how we believe they look. And now you see these two beings in real life. And so you would have run. You would have stand there. I think I may have just freeze. How about you? I was either going to freeze or run. <laughs> freeze or run, right? You see these two angels and then you see this bright light. This bright light. Now, and here comes hope for these two ladies. Here comes good news. What question did he ask? Why do you what? Why do you look for the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why are you here looking for Jesus' body? That, the, that question is telling you, um, or it's at, when he asked that question, is it saying that Jesus isn't dead anymore? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Have you forgotten the promise? That's what the angels asked the ladies. Have you forgotten the promise that he will be risen? And what did they tell, um, what did the angel tell the ladies to do? To what? Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell the disciples to share the news. Jerry, when you get a good news, what do you want to do with it? Spread it. You want to spread it when you're at school and you get a 95 year test. You want everybody to see your paper, right? You say when everybody say, boy, will you get Jair, right? You there wrong to show paper. Look on this side, I get a 90, right, Jay? But if I get a 60, where did your paper? Right. Put that in your bag. Put that in your bag instead. What you get? Why you not have to do what I get, right? <laughs> I had a paper and I want nobody to see a 60. But when I get a 90, you want to share it. So this is what the angels were telling these two ladies. Good news. He is not dead. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Go and share with the villagers that he is what? What's the word? Risen. He is risen. Jesus is risen. So now I can imagine the joy. You can, you can, you can imagine the joy with this lady. When somebody is sick for you, let's say you had your grandmother or somebody that was sick and you look at them laying down there sick and you go over there and you look at them and they're not moving. Maybe they have a fever or something like that. And when you go back and you look into that room and you see that that person is not on that bed and they say, where granny? And they say, boy, grand feel better. How that make you feel? Happy, renewed joy. Correct. It make you feel good. It's like, yes. Granny, I know now. Granny, no grain. Granny will be here with us. You feel good, right? You feel good because now that person is back to his or her normal self. So that's how I believe that they felt. They felt like, you know what? We never wrong. In your face, like we would have said to these people who thought that they nailed Jesus to the cross and now he is dead. So now tell me what happened next in the story. We are ready. The angels appeared to Joanna, appeared to Mary, and told them to go and tell the good news. What happened next? Mary Magdalene returned to the tomb quietly weeping. His body is gone, and I will never see him again. She grieved. 
deciding to leave, she she said she meant she bent down over she bent down over for one last look in the tomb. She gasped. The two angels the other woman had seen earlier were back. Woman, why are you crying? All right, right there. Right there. Stop right there for me before you go for it. Let me ask you a question. Who is this Mary now, Mary Magdalene? Well, Mary Magdalene was molested by her uncle. Okay. Had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. Okay. Amen, so Amen indeed. She was caught in adultery and thrown at Jesus' feet. Perfect place to be. And she washed Jesus' feet with her hair, expensive oil, and her tears. And her tears. So here we have Mary. Mary had a long history to her name, all right? So she was caught in adultery. She was thrown at Jesus' feet. She had demons cast out of her. She was molested. So now she is at the tomb of Jesus. And she's sad because Jesus is her friend. The Bible said that after Jesus forgave Mary, Mary followed Jesus everywhere he went. So now here is your friend, the person, the only person that you felt true love from. No, you don't see his body. You're at the tomb and he is not there. So now Mary, more grief on top of grief. So what happened now? Mary is at the tomb and she looks into the tomb for the last time and said, Man, my Lord and Savior Jesus' body is gone. What happened next? They have taken my Lord away, Mary said, and... I don't know where they have put him. Sensing the, presence. Sensing the presence of someone behind her, Mary Magdalene turned around and saw a man standing there. Woman, why are you crying? He asked kindly. Who, who is it you are looking for? Mary thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, wiping her eyes. If you have carried him away, tell me where you have carried him. Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Mary, Mary called a very Mary, Mary called a very familiar voice. My teacher, Mary exclaimed, bowing to his feet. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, he said. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and you and your father to my god and your god see all right so here we go now i say to that hallelujah praise the lord now mary is there at the tomb and mary heard somebody call her name or not her name but she heard somebody say woman right and a familiar voice a voice that she is that she have heard before and when Mary turned around, who did Mary see? Jesus. Mary saw Jesus. Now, the two women before Mary and um, Joanna, they only saw the angels. And the angels said, go and give the good news. But Mary was so brokenhearted. She's here now. She's like, man, this is it. This is the end. My Savior is gone. He is he's gone forever. Amen. And then, go ahead. Oh, the magic for Mary, that was heartbreaking because, I mean... I from her past, you can tell that she was she didn't really have the a past that a lot of people expected. And then on top of that, three days before that, her master was killed. And That's then right. go back to her to his to his burial place, as we would call it. And he's not there. That, That's that must right. have been heartbreaking. Oh yes, very heartbreaking. Now look at this. Jesus saw Mary Day in all her anguish and all her agony and all her pain and her broken heart. And Jesus said, know what? She is so devastated, I have to appear to her. To give her what? The big word we would deal with today, I give her what? Hope. Give her hope, to give her hope. So Jesus decides, correct. Give her hope, give her the confidence to, to, to say to you, you know what? That this is not the end and that this Jesus, this savior of the world that I believe in, this person that saved my life, that changed me completely, that he is risen, he's alive. So Mary was excited. If you haven't seen, like your mother is a waste of studying. You guys' mother a waste of studying. Imagine you're in your room one of these morning. I just asked somebody, said Jair, and somebody said Chase, and I listen to that voice and I said, "What? That song like my ma, right? You get what? How you get? Excited. You get excited because mommy is home. And then what's the first thing you'd want to do? Hug. Well, I give her a big hug. 
So I imagine this boy, I stand up make this your height, man. Stand up make the people say your height. You see how tall this boy is? Imagine this boy just jump on her, his mom, right? Because he haven't seen his mom for a long time. And you want to embrace your mom. But what did Jesus say when Mary wanted to touch him? Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I haven't what? Ascended. I haven't to ascended to my father. So Mary, not touch me. Not touch me. I haven't ascended to my father. I want you to go and do something. What did Jesus tell him to go and do? To tell, to tell the end. Disciples. Yeah, to go to his brothers, tell my brothers, tell my brothers that I am what? Ascending. I am I am what? The word begins Ascending. with R. Risen. risen. I am risen. Go tell my brothers that you said spread the what? Spread the news. Spread the good news. The good news that the Savior is a what? Begins with A. Alive. He is alive. Spread the good news that the Savior is alive. Now imagine the joy for Mary. Imagine the joy for Mary. Mary seeing her Savior there. I could imagine with all that light, with all that glory on him. And she sees her Savior alive. He's not in the grave. Nobody not take your body. Nobody has stolen his body. He is alive. He's not in the grave. And he spoke to her. He spoke to her before Jesus appeared or spoke to anybody. He appeared and he spoke to Mary. What do you think that was? Why do you think Jesus would choose to appear to Mary? Out of everybody, he could have appeared to Peter. He could have appeared to, um, to any one of his disciples. Matthew, to doubting Thomas. We had Thomas whenever I believed nothing. He could have appeared to Thomas and said, you know what, Thomas? Here I am, right? First, he could have appeared to Thomas first. Why do you believe he appeared to Mary? Um, I believe he appeared to Mary to give Mary that extra nudge of confidence and Hope and happiness. Correct. She get, he appeared to Mary to lift Mary's spirit to know all is not lost. Why do you think? Mary was discouraged and broken. Mary was discouraged and broken. And when we are discouraged, I like that. I like how you brought it. Mary was discouraged and Mary was broken. And so when we are down there deep in our dark valley and we feel discouraged and broken, who comes? The Lord. Here comes who? The Lord. Here comes Jesus. Here comes the Lord. To what? Lift us up. To lift us up and give us, give us what? Hope. Re re renewed hope. Renewed hope. To give us renewed hope. To give us confidence. To let us know, you know, you know what, girl? Listen, I have won this. You are not defeated. When I died on the cross, when I was buried and I resurrected, I won all of this. So you are not defeated. You are not hopeless. No matter what you're going through, you're not. His death, his burial, and his resurrection give us renewed hope. I like that. Now, we have breaking news where? On what? ATN. On ATN. What are the breaking news? That Jesus Christ is re re resurrected. Oh, but you're not said a news excited, man. <laughs> said a news excited. Jesus, Jesus is what? Jesus Christ is resurrected. Jesus Christ is what? Resurrected. Jesus Christ is what? Resurrected. Jesus Christ is resurrected. Believe breaking news by ATN. Yeah. And what we want you to do with this news, we want you to share it. Give me some money. Social media thing we want to share. Share with a friend when you get good news out. I want everybody hear this good news. Where would you share it on what? Instagram. Instagram, where would you share it? TikTok. TikTok, where would you share it? TikTok too, TikTok too. and then Facebook. If my daughters hear me saying this thing, they say, my, you can't say anything. I know they call Instagram IG, right? Yeah. And they call Facebook FB, right? No. <laughs> then I want to say FB, right? And then I have TikTok. And you get your phone and you do a leading for TikTok, right? So we would create a TikTok to let the whole world know that Jesus is what? Resurrected. Jesus is resurrected. He is risen. He is alive. The grave cannot hold him down anymore. I could imagine one and don't get a little sheet, wrap it wrong, you know, jump out on the bed. That's the one I do. They don't have a little <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what would you have done to show that Jesus is alive? He is risen. And then they have another one, Snapchat. I think Snapchat is Snapchat. another one. So those are the things that we would share this good news on. We would tell the world that Jesus is risen. He's not in his grave. No matter how they try to hold him there. No matter how the enemy may think he will. He what? He win. When he see up on the cross, I could imagine he just, you know, half in glory. I said, well, that, that it. Shop shit. That's right, shop shit. But what shop shit? No. no. Three days later, the shop what? Shop the open. shop opened, right? The shop opened. And here comes who? Jesus. 
Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. You know when Jesus was risen and when that angel appeared to Mary, when the angel name was Angel Gabriel, it said that he came, there was a big what? There was a big what? There was a big earthquake. The whole world, the whole earth shake just for one angel. Just for one angel, the whole world shake. Now imagine when Jesus to come back in all the power and the glory. He had come back, the Bible says heaven are empty. Jesus had come back with this. He had come back with the God, the Father. He had come back with all the angels, the sun on the throne. You can imagine the power where they come that. And if one angel could make the world shake, then... No, no. Well, what happened? <laughs> well, what happened when whole of heaven come down here? What happened when Jesus called on you? That's right. Guys. What will happen when the whole host of heaven is coming back to this world? That is the day we're looking forward to. Amen. That is the day. You want to be there, Jair? Yes, so. Do you want to look up and see Jesus coming in the clouds yes, of heaven? So. In, his, in his full glory. But the Bible says, when he comes, those that are not ready to meet him, they will be slayed by his brightness. So they would be killed. They were high for now. I said, rocks fall on us, fall on us. They, they would want to die. Swallow them. They would want to die. But those of us that are ready, we will look up and we will see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, coming in its full power. Man, I excited just to talk about this thing. Right? I excited just talking about it. But I want to ask you guys a question this morning. What does Jesus' resurrection and that beautiful morning that he resurrected, he appeared to Mary, what does his resurrection, him now seated in heaven on his throne, interceding for me and you, what does his resurrection, what does that resurrection mean to you? I believe that it means that there is hope for all of us that we can Amen. turn our lives to him and that how there is still a chance for us to go and be with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is hope for all of us. You are not hopeless. That is what Mr. Guru is saying. You are not hopeless. Jesus' resurrection gives all of us hope of eternal life. Tell me, Jair. Hope to live and be happy. Hope to live and be happy in our sad life. You know, when you think about, you know, all that I face in this world, one day I will go somewhere that my Savior had prepared for me where I have no more pain. What else will I have the heaven? No more sadness. No more sadness. No more death. That's not the main thing. No more debt. There will be no more debt. No more separating from our loved ones in heaven. We will have a chance to be happy. Eternally happy. Fully happy. Tell me, Chase, what does it mean? When you know that Jesus is resurrected, it means that even though dead family members are, are dead, when Jesus comes out, we will still be able to sit in. We will still be able to see our family members, those that have died in the Lord, those that are resting in the Lord. On that day, Jesus won the victory over death. And so on that day when he comes back, all of our family members that have died 50, 60, 70, 3, 4 months, 5, 6 years ago, we will be able to see those that are resting in the Lord. And I say praise the what? Praise, praise, the, Lord. The, Lord. praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We'll be able to see our loved ones. He is coming back. Jesus is risen. He's not in the grave ever anymore. They nailed him to the cross. They put his body in a tomb, but on the third day, he rose again, and he is alive. He is alive. He is well. Now, I want to leave you guys with this story before we close this morning. There is this story that is told of, but, um, in, I would say, in the ancient times, when you used to have kings that rule, and when a king would sit at the table to eat, they would always, when you go to a, rest, when I go to a restaurant, they fancy restaurant that believes, right? They give you a, a, a cloth, right? They give you a, like you that saw a napkin or a tissue. You will take that and you will spread that on your what? Cool. All right, spread it right there and I lap for your eat. So you don't mess up yourself, right? So you would eat with that. Now, back in, back in ancient times, they would give kings that. They would sit, they would take their cloth, they would spread it and they would eat. Now, if this, my husband always give the story, I hope I give it correct, all right? When the king takes the cloth off, and the king just drops the cloth there on the table. The king is saying to whoever is eating with him, I am not finished with my meal. I'm only taking a break and I'm coming back. So I just drop my cloth right there. Leave my cloth, leave my food. I am coming back. That's the indication. But when the king gets up from the table, 
All right? Now, when the king dropped the cloth, the king said, I am finished with my meal. I am not coming back. I am finished with my meal, so you guys can clear the table. But when you see the king get sucked from the table and the king takes his cloth and the king folds his cloth nice and sets the cloth there and the king move away, the king is saying, I'm not finished with my meal. I am coming back to finish. So don't touch my meal because I folded my cloth nicely and I set it there. Now, you said something earlier in our discussion. When Mary looked in the tomb, what did she see? So how the cloth was folded nicely, nicely on, the, on the place that he laid. That's right. The cloth was folded nicely, and that cloth folded nicely indicates what? That that indicates back. what? That he's coming back. back. He is coming back. He's not what? And his work here is not finished. He's not finished. He is coming back. So Jesus folded his cloth nicely and said, I am coming back. I am only on a different mission, but I am coming back. So I want to encourage you this morning that Jesus is coming back. However you may feel, his death, his burial, and his resurrection was not in vain. That was so you and I can have eternal life and live with him eternally. And I want to tell you, wherever you are, I want you to reach out to Jesus because he is there. He loves you. He is risen. He has won the victory over whatever you're facing. You can find hope in who? Jesus. Hope in Jesus because he is what? Risen. He is risen. He is risen. So, lady and gentlemen, I thank you very much for joining us this morning in our discussion here for our lesson review. Let's bow our heads then as we pray. We would like you to pray for us. Let us pray. Dear kind of Holy Father God, I thank you for your life. I thank you for allowing us to come here to ATN and produce this beautiful, beautiful lesson today. Yeah. Please allow this lesson today to inspire and chain and help the whole place. Bless us and take care of us throughout the rest of the week. In your name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. All right. Thank you guys very much. And thank you so much for joining us. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lesson study from the junior class and that you enjoyed your special from James Scarborough Primary School. You know, we had such a, a wonderful little session with Amelia this morning and we spoke about one of our first challenges that kids faced. It was about, what was it about, sis? It was about making good food choices. Mm -hmm. You know, but young people and kids also, um, you know, struggle with making choices about what to do when it comes to having fun, or in other mm -hmm. words, entertainment. Mm -hmm. you know, so we have a little video from one of our Adventist youths again, um, Alex, and he'll be sharing some. He'll be sharing a scenario with us that a lot of our young people face. So uh, let's hear what Alex has to say. Happy Sabbath. My name is Alex. I always complete my homework and chores on time. When I'm finished, I would like to play video games or watch YouTube videos. But my grandmother says that I should do something more constructive at learning my Sabbath school memories or reading. I don't understand what's the big deal. I already did do it during morning worship and throughout the day. Why can't I just spend my time doing the things that I enjoy, especially after I've completed everything I needed to do already? Explaining that, you know, he doesn't understand why after he's done everything, done his chores, why he can't spend time doing the things that he likes. You know, you, I've done everything else. Mm -hmm. Like, leave me to have the time that I have. And I'm sure lots of kids feel this way. I sometimes feel this way. Um, and I'm sure many Christians might feel that um, I've done what I needed to do for God. This little time is my time. Let me just watch this movie that I like or this episode that I like. Um, but it's what's like, wrong with that, Sister Sophia? What's the what's, virtue that we should have? Well, the virtue that we should have, let's go into our little box, right? is that we should guard our hearts and Amen. mind, right? God tells us we should guard our hearts and mind. So Amen. this is our virtue. We should be guarding our hearts and mind. And this is as it relates to choices for entertainment. You know, in the first segment, we look at food choices. And now we want to look at entertainment choices. And, um, you know, in, when, when we go back to the beginning with Adam and Eve, you know, Satan had a conversation with Eve and he kind of planted a seed in her mind, you know, when he mentioned mm -hmm. this fruit and what's happening with this fruit. And ever since they had that conversation, Eve kept thinking about it until she finally had to make a decision about whether she was going to, you know, glorify, um, you know, God's commandment. 
And sometimes we don't realize that what we watch, what we read, what we choose what we for on too long. Right, what we choose for entertainment, it stays right there in our minds and, and it kind of informs the decisions that we make afterwards. So like you said, we do have to guard our minds and our hearts. So it's important, even choices for entertainment, especially for the kids. Yes, in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it, right? And mm -hmm. whenever I would ask Sky, Sky, what is your heart? He would say, it's your mind, mind right? It's because mind. this is what God, this is where we do all the thinking, where we do all the processing. And this is what God is speaking about that we must guard, right? Because this is what determines mm -hmm. how, we, how we behave, how we react, how we speak. Yeah, so right, our right. mind is what determines all of this, right? And also like to look at Philippians 4, 6 to 8. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right? So finally, Bridget, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever what is, is right. right, whatever is pure, pure. whatever is lovely, mm -hmm. whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy think about such things so this is what god wants us to think about right he didn't say to fill your minds with all these games and these things right but we're supposed to fill our, our minds with things that are true things that are right things that are pure right and we know that god is a pure holy loving god right we should fill it with things that are lovely and admirable right Amen. I love that when it comes to little children because we choose what we think is important for our kids to learn to be able to withstand this world. And I don't think that's one of the first things that come to our mind mm -hmm. that we have to teach them to guard their mind. You know, we teach them about good touch, bad touch. We teach them about manners. We teach them about but what is very, very important early is to guard their mind. And that's you know, true. in the in the scripture reading, you say, what is it that's going to guard our hearts and our minds? It says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. understanding. So if you raise children in a spiritual home where they have access to a relationship with God, it's that peace of God that will help to guard their hearts and minds. And they will want to spend their time, their entertainment. They will make positive choices that invite God into their little life um, lifestyle. And we want to teach them that very early because it's very hard to do that as an adult when we're mm -hmm. setting our little ways and, you know, this is my program, this is my sports, this is my hobby. We don't see how um, sometimes it takes away, what there's a word for that, you know, when it takes away from God, when God is not the priority anymore, begins with I. What does that word say? Idolatry. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right? So that means it becomes our idol. Sometimes we say, but we don't serve other gods, mm -hmm. right? Thinking that in, in the Bible speaks about them creating structures or statues, and these were the idols that they worship. But the idols that we worship today are the things that occupy our time, the things Amen. that we, we invest our time in. Those are the idols that we have today. So we got to be careful. The more time we spend with these idols or our phones or our TV, our computers, the more time we spend on these Amen. things is, is the time that we should be spending with God. So then we end up pushing God out of our life and we end up with all these Correct. impure thoughts and things within in our minds. Amen. Amen. And I, just before you give the, the kids their little challenge, I just wanted to read <laughs> Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, we might think that we have to do a lot of things to try to keep in line with what God wants us to do. But if we simply love God, it's going to be natural for us. I'm not going to remember all the rules that mommy has. You know, don't do this, don't do that. But if I love mommy, I will know right away that hmm, mommy might not want me to. Yeah, I know please. what choices to make because love informs those choices. So we don't have to worry about all the rules of when it comes to food or entertainment. But we think about if we love God, what would God have us to do in terms of honoring our temple, in terms of protecting our minds? That's right. So that's for so the adults. That's, that's, that's more for the adults to think about. But for the kids... 
we want them to have a, a fun little challenge that will help them to, to remember this point. Yes, yeah, so let's get into our challenge when it comes to entertainment, right? Yeah. So our challenge is, and of course for this challenge, you may need to ask an adult for assistance. You're supposed to take a glass of water and fill it right up to the top, right? So you're going to fill the glass all the way to the top, find some small objects, marbles, coins, pebbles, um, small stones, small toys, whatever object you can find at home, right? Our hearts are full of God and his love. That is the cup of cup and water, right? So our hearts, we are the cup and our love for God is the water. But there are many things we enjoy in our lives. So think about the things that we enjoy, whether it's video games, watching TV or toys, whether it's shopping, whether it's eating, clothes, playing sports. And then you pick an object and you're going to make each object represent one of these things that you enjoy. So you pick up an object, then you drop it into the cup of water, right? And you're going to do this for each thing that you like. Everything that you like will represent one of the, every object will represent one of the things that you like. If it's watching TV, shopping, whatever it is, and you will drop it in the cup of water. Repeat it a few times and then discuss with the adult what happens to the water, right? And that will be your challenge for today. Remember, God wants us to enjoy many things because he gives us all of these things by blessing our parents with the finances and the resources to, for us to have these toys and so forth. But when we spend too much time thinking about them or doing them, they can start to push God out of our hearts and mind. And we talk with our family about how, talk to the adult about how you can keep God first in your heart and mind, right? So that's the activity that you have or the challenge that you have for this Men virtue, for, right? <laughs> for uh, what was the virtue? It was to guard your heart and, and your mind, mind, right, against entertainment and choices. So we covered two already, sis. You know that that uh, our, little, our little kids have challenges with when it comes to food and choosing what to watch and how to have fun. There's another one that's a little challenge. I don't know if you want to ask Sky about that one. Yes, let's see what our another what is our next scenario right what's our next virtue that we have challenges with good morning my name is Skylar and I love to play games okay Sky so tell us about your experience playing games well so you like winning yes oh. but I I sometimes used to play with Monopoly, trying to cheat. How do you cheat? Hmm. Maybe trying to say that I passed go two times to get my amount of money I have to have. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe to add more money to the credit card of Monopoly and then win. But why do you do this, guy? So I win. So that you could win, right? You like mm. to feel how it feels when you win, right? And tell me, based on your experience, how does the other players feel when they find out that you cheat? Bad. Bad? Do they want to play with you? No. So then it makes it no fun for them, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so Sky is being pretty honest here, right? right? And we know a lot of kids, I think a lot of kids love to win, right? Mm -hmm. And Skylar loves to win too. So let's see, right? So the next challenge that kids have um, is when your temptation is when it comes to cheating. You know what Sky said is very true. We all want to win. We want to come in first. But what's the virtue that we, we should have when it comes to this topic of cheating? It feels good when you come in first, right Sky? <laughs> <laughs> so we must be justly right so the virtue for for cheating is that we must be justly that means we must behave just right? right just as god that means we should make right choices yes and we have to think about when we're making Being a fair. decision 
right? That we're being fair to other people. And so Sky said, like, I know that they don't enjoy the game, but I'm winning, so... And he likes the feeling of winning, right? We have to think about <laughs> others. You know, there's a story in Joshua 6 where God gave the people of Israel some rules on how to defeat Jericho. Oh. Um you know, and Sky's, one of Sky's favorite stories. Really? You know this story? Well, tell us the story then, Sky. What so, was the strange rules that God told, told the Israelites for Jericho? The most strangest rule that when God tell Joshua to march, march around the walls seven days, and on the seventh day you must march seven times. Hmm. And then when you don't march seven times, he will say, then they will shout, the Lord has given me this city. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yes, and then what happened? I could tell you, their walls dropped down. Wow. Yes, so God's, God's <laughs> rules was, was um, specific, right? And they followed it, and when they followed it, they were able to defeat, right? The, the city enemy. of, yeah, right. the enemy, and they were able to, to, overcome the city of Jericho, right? Okay. And if they, they God asked them afterwards, you know, that take the best of the treasures that you have, you know, and offer it back. Um, take the best from the city and offer it back to God, you know, as a token, thanksgiving of the victory. But there was one person who had loved treasure more than they loved God, mm-hmm. right? I don't know who is that person. You know who that person is? It's Mr. Right. Mr. Akon. Akon, right? <laughs> so what Akon did was he took some robe and he took some gold and he, he t- hid it, right? He took, he took a Babylonian robe uh-huh. with cast a lot of money in the mm-hmm. old times. He took 20 bars of gold and 200 silver coins. Oh, but was he supposed to take those? No. No, so he was cheating. He was not following God's instruction. Imagine that you try to cheat God. (laughs) And think that he wouldn't know or find out. Right, God knew exactly what he took and where he hid it. And, you know, it goes back to how we try to um, cheat in everything that we do. As Christians, we have to remember that God knows our hearts. And he says in, this is one of the important commandments. It says in Acts chapter, in Deuteronomy, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, 10 commandments. Exodus oh, chapter 20, yes. 20, verse 15, the commandment is, thou shall not steal. Mm-hmm. When we think about cheating, we don't always think about stealing right away. But how can we make the comparison that if you're cheating, you're also stealing? Because you're stealing someone else's rightful victory. They're yeah. not able to win because you're stealing their victory away from them. Mm-hmm. So then you're breaking a commandment, Skylar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? so, so we should not we should not cheat right it says you shall not steal neither deal false neither lie to one another that's acts 5 1 to 9 and it says in james 4 17 if anyone then knows um the good they ought to do and doesn't do it it is a sin for them so we know we're not supposed to cheat Amen. right and if we cheat then we are sinning because we know that we're supposed to do what is right. Right, Sky. So when you play Monopoly again because you love that game and you want to cheat, <laughs> you have to remember that if I cheat, I am stealing mommies, I am stealing granny, I am stealing my friend's opportunity cousin, to win at this game. And so that makes me not only a cheater, but that makes me a robber, a stealer too. All right, so we want to think about that. I, w- I just wanted to share um, here that sometimes when we want something so badly, it's tempting to take matters into our own hands, right? That's why we cheat, because if I wait to play the game the fairly, I'm not sure if I will win. So I take it into my own hand and I make sure that I will win by doing this. But what? Cheating shows that we don't trust God. God. It shows that we don't trust God. Um, Enough to follow the rules. Follow that the was rules. what Achan did, right? God promised them victories, but he he decided he would have his own victory and he would he would do his own thing. And then God did not allow them to get the victory until Achan's um, error was corrected. So Correct. we're showing that we don't trust God, right? We don't trust God enough. Right. Playing by the rules means that you can give glory to God for your victory. 
playing by the rules also means that you play fairly, that you act justly. justly. That's so right. When we think about cheating, thinking, think about how it allows us the opportunity to glorify God by giving Him the honor and the glory. That we can't say, I did anything to allow this to happen. These were God's rule and I played by the rules. So all the victory, all the glory belongs to Him. Amen. Amen. Right? So we want to leave the kids with that little challenge. Yes, we have to leave them with a challenge, right? Because we have to overcome these situations, right? So, so our next it. challenge. Mm -hmm. So this, this challenge is for you, Sky. Go ahead and read it. Is there someone? Is there some way that you have cheated? Confess your sin to God. Make it right with the other person. As well, try again and follow the rules this time. So, Sky, we see that indeed you're to go and you're supposed to apologize to those you played Monopoly with. And you're going to play again. But this time you're going to play fairly and By justly, right? By the rules, right? Yeah. So, if you win, you win. If you don't win, then that was how God saw it should be, right? So let's play fair, right? So that's Amen. a challenge for you guys. You guys can do the same with your situation. Amen. So we're going to take a little break and we'll come back to our last two um, virtues. We're going to have a special song by one of the kids and then we'll be right back. Welcome back. Um, we hope that you have been enjoying our 13th Sabbath program. I certainly have. How about you, Sister Sa? I'm enjoying it too, right? Yes. So much fun. We don't have all these scenarios, these situations that these kids, they go through. Right. And seeing them participate. It's good when we get to see them on, um, on camera a little bit more often than just our faces, right? That's true. So I love the set for them. I'm happy that it's 13th Sabbath and I get to be involved. And so we want to share two more virtues with you that go, goes back to some of the ten temptations. Let's try to remember the first temptation temptation has to do with making decisions about one food. food and then we also have to make decisions about entertainment, entertainment. right and then we had looked at like oh cheating cheating so we've done three already <laughs> and we want to do two more where, where where cheating is there's another one that follows close by right That's and that true. one is that one is lying, lying right so now we're going to hear about the situation from Ayana um, online, right? Let's see what she has to say. Right, so. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ayana Williams, and I'm eight years old. And I have a message for you. I had a friend ever since I started school, and we used to always hang out together until she started to hang out with not so nice kids. And uh, one time she told a lie on me in class that I was talking, but I didn't get in much trouble for it, so it didn't bother me. But another time she told a lie on me that I was using bad words. And the other kids supported her lies. So my teacher didn't believe me, and I was sent to the principal's office. I was so scared, but I continued to tell the truth, so later on, the principal realized that I was being honest. So this experience taught me that she was not honest, and she was not a good friend. So the message for you is don't tell lies, continue telling the truth, or start telling the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
We see Ayana, how she, how she presented this situation, right? So we see lying is wrong, and people lie because they want something so much. So her friends, mm -hmm. her friend, even though they were very good friends, lied on her because they wanted to be accepted in the in crowd, right? And mm -hmm. the in crowd sometimes is not always the best crowd right. because they were not some of the so nice kids, right? And we see that when we lie, we are hurting God's reputation, but not only God's reputation, right? we're hurting also the people around, around us, right? Because we see how um, Ayana was hurt, right, yes. by this situation. And it's such a sad little scenario, but it's a very realistic scenario. And it's one that as Christians, we tend to find ourselves in um, often. But I'm glad that she was able to be honest. And she was not the perpetrator in this case, right? She was still honest, but she was a victim of what it feels like when other people... Um, lie and the, the ripple effects that it has and sometimes as Christians and as adults we tend to have the same experiences as it relates to trying to fit in the world sometimes when it comes to you know a job we know that we worship God we know that his Sabbath is on Saturday but we lie and say no I can come in for this time or sometimes we lie to fit in and what we often try to fit in is the opposite of what God wants for us as mm -hmm. one and teach the little kids very early that it doesn't matter how you know good the reason is that you think you should lie, whether it's to protect yourself or it's to protect your friend or to try to fit in, that we should never lie because it never ends well. Either we are hurting somebody else or it's going to turn around and it's going to hurt, hurt us. us too. So the virtue that goes along with this is actually honesty, right? Be so honest. be honest. So we see that we ought to be honest, right? So we don't hurt God and we don't hurt those around us. Or we don't hurt ourselves because sometimes we end up hurting ourselves too, right? Yeah. The Bible actually has quite a lot to say about honesty and why we shouldn't lie. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22, what does it say? It says, Lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but those who deal, deal faithfully are His delight, right? So... God does not like a lying lip. In other words, those who are honest are his delight. And we can look at a number of other Bible characters who, because of their honesty, it was counted to them as righteousness, right? The Lord blessed them. Um, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11, there is a story there. And that story is about you, sis? No. <laughs> actually, right, when we... When we, when we this story is actually in the New Testament, mm -hmm. right? But um, when we hear about this story, it's one of the stories that comes to mind when you when you hear about the topic lying, right? Mm -hmm. This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira, right? Mm -hmm. When they had <laughs> promised that they would give to God what rightfully belonged, what to, rightfully his. belonged to him. And then in the end, they got greedy and they decided, you know, okay, okay we're going to lie and we're going to say no. It didn't happen, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we weren't able to... To sell for the value, and then they end up they they ended up lying, and what happened when they lied? God punished them. God punished them, right? And this is like extreme punishment mm -hmm. because they didn't even have a chance to to do this a, a second time, repeat this this right um, this sin again. Right away, the Lord struck them down, and they fell dead. Right, so we see. That lying could have some serious consequences, right? The Lord truly does not like lying, right? And that's what it tells us in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11, that we shall not steal or deal falsely, neither lie to one, one another. another. And also Proverbs 19, 5 says, a false witness, right? Someone who tells lies will not go unpunished. And we mm -hmm. see even with the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it did not go unpunished, right? So they were punished instantaneously, right? He said, whoever pours out lies will not go free. So God will hold you accountable if you tell a lie, right? You know, I like how often in these verses, lying and cheating goes together. You know, if you're going to lie, it's because you are going to deal this honestly with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, these, these sins kind of cluster together, these temptations, <laughs> they work together. So if we're honest... We're going to naturally act justly. So we mm -hmm. see the virtues also build on each other as so well. Intermingle or hand in hand yes. with each other. So we want to, you know, leave the challenge for the kids when it comes to lying. I know it's hard, especially as kids, because that's where we 
Uh, I think we have the most practice with line. That's where we're introduced to line <laughs> when they, the they think they can outsmart mm -hmm. others, right? Mm. So they, they say a little lie here and there because they want to get away with something, mm -hmm. right? But let's see what our challenge is for, for this virtue. It says, have you lied to someone this week? Hmm. Mm. <laughs> Talk to your parents about it, right? You will need to be brave. And indeed, you will need to be brave because it's not so easy to admit when you are wrong or when you have lied, right? So talk to your parents about it. Then tell the person who you lied to or lied about. Apologize to them and tell them the truth. It's difficult, but be brave, right? You'll be doing the right thing. And you know what? You will feel better in the end, even if there is a consequence, right? Mm -hmm. That means even if there is something that will happen to you, you will feel better knowing that you were honest. And I always tell Skylar that, Sky, always tell the truth. Even if it means you will get in trouble, say the truth. It's important that you say the truth, right? right. And even if you get in trouble, it allows for you to forgive him. You know, so honesty allows us when we go to God and we're honest, it allows for God to forgive us. If we don't be, if we're not honest mm -hmm. with God, how can he forgive us when we've done something wrong? And so honesty goes a very long way. That's right. true. So that's, that's for lying. That's one of the challenges. And then one of the last challenges that we want to look at, we're going to ask little Azalea to help us with this challenge. All right, so we're going to go to her video and she's going to introduce the last little temptation that our kids face. Azela, my love, why do you look so sad today? Well, this friend that I have, she, she, um, she, when always she comes over, she wants the same doll. And I tell her there's so many other toys that you could choose from. Then she said, I want the same doll. I told her no because there's so many other toys she can choose from and there's a other Barbie. And then she says she wants the exact toy what I have and every day she makes playing no fun. And then every day when she comes over she wants the same doll. So sad for little Azalea. Yes, oh man. <laughs> right, but we see mm -hmm. how much she, pain she's in, right? Yes, because she wants to share and she wants to play and she's willing to share her toys and she's willing to share them all, but her friend only wants one specific one. And I'm assuming that based on based on Azalea's presentation, that is the one toy that Azalea she's wants to play with. The too. one that she wants to play with. Yes. So, can you can you grasp what we're we're trying what is trying to come out here? And then there's a word for that, and it's called <laughs> covetousness. Yes. All right. Or for little kids, it's called jealousy. You know, in Exodus chapter twenty, verse seventeen, it says, "Do not want anything that belongs to someone, someone else. else." This is the kids' version. Mm -hmm. Man, that's hard. That is so hard. That is really hard indeed. <laughs> Coveting. I mean, there's a separate commandment for that because God knows that we tend to be jealous, that he could give us everything we need, but when we see what other people have, we, we want, want it too. We want what they have or better than what they have, right? And that's a huge challenge, I think, for kids. And that when we grow up with that, especially in this world that is full of comparisons, in order for the media you know, to promote this toy or to promote this whatever it is, it's filled with comparisons, um, and that's something that children have to face at a higher level than we've ever had to face um, in our generation, I would imagine. We didn't have TV to see all that other kids had to play with. We didn't, I mean, yes, we had TV, but we didn't, have <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have so much awareness at our fingertips to compare what's happening in that side of the world to see um, the, you latest. Know, the latest, what's top of the line, what's this, what's that. Um, but this what's is a new model. What's a new model? But this is an ancient problem. Even without media, without technology, this is a, a heart. This is a flesh problem, and it shows itself even in our, the behavior of children. That we tend to want things that are not ours. We tend to desire after things, you know, that God never intended um, to be for us. You know. So, what does God tell us about covetousness? Well. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to do the virtues? Yes, let's do the virtue before we find out what God has to tell us about this. 
um, about covetousness, right? So the virtue is to be satisfied, right? Simple. Yes, it's so simple, simple and easy. Right. We are supposed to be satisfied with what we have, right? I love what Philippians chapter 4, verse, uh, verses 11 and 13, Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whether hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Okay, so we see that God doesn't want us to be happy or sad based on what we have or what we don't have in this world, right? Instead, we should always rejoice because what he of what we have in Christ Jesus, right? Amen. That is what God intends. So no matter how hard our lives are or how few things we have, we can know that we will be spending eternity in heaven with Jesus if we just trust, trust in him. him. Trust that he's given us exactly what we need, that what somebody else has, that was meant for them. Or maybe it wasn't meant for them and you are desiring after an abomination, you know, that's not, that was meant to mm -hmm. harm them. Every time I think about it, I said, Lord, I want to be rich because I want to help people. I want to give them things. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to be more impactful to people around me. But then when I think about it, I said, you know what? The Lord probably knows why he does not make me rich. Maybe I'll be like the rich young, young ruler, right? When Jesus told him to go, okay, you want to follow me? Go and give up all that you have. And he was so He hard. didn't want to do that mm -hmm. because he wasn't contented, right? So God knows why you don't have certain things, right? It's for your own salvation, for your own, for your own well-being, right? right? So be content, be satisfied, be happy with what you have, what the Lord has provided for you there's a reason why he has right Amen. because i can say i might not be rich rich but the little i have the lord still allows me to help others i might not be able to help them the way i want to or the way i desire to but you know what it's like almost something like the, the widow and her might right, right. Mm -hmm. it's you're given the best, best that, that you that can you and can. so you know what it has even more value Amen. right more satisfaction when you're Amen. able to help them well sister safira i still want to be rich <laughs> but i am satisfied with what i have we'll right be now. rich in heaven right Amen. you just gotta keep on trusting Amen. jesus god has blessed <laughs> us in other ways um in luke chapter 12 verse 15 it talks mm -hmm. about where covetousness comes from it says then he said to them watch out be on guard against all kinds of greed life does not consist in an abundance of possessions and mm -hmm. that is what fuels jealousy because we are greedy and because we think that all that this life is is what we can possess what we can call mine what we, you know our money or land or mm -hmm. assets no we have fancy names for possessions show. right or wealth but God tells us and reminds us you're going to be tempted as you grow older, but life is not about your wealth, your possessions. And I even like 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 to 8, right, where it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, right? So being godly and being satisfied with what the Lord has given to us, it's great satisfaction. It's, it's a great blessing, right? It's a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content Amen. with that. So we should be content with the little we have, right? And God meets our need with food, with clothing, even with a shelter over our head, right? Whatever Amen. little blessing God has given us, we should be happy with it, right? right? I might not have a big mansion on a hillside, but I'll get a big mansion in heaven, in heaven right? right? But while we're here on earth... I'm happy never, with what I have. <laughs> never seen the righteous forsaken or bringing for bread. So God will always give us what we need. We just have to trust him, you know. And so we want to leave that message with the kids. And of course, we want to close this segment with a challenge. We want to, yes. um, um, you know, give them an, an experience that they can practice, give them some help. So, yes, so uh, that they can overcome these situations. So mm -hmm. let's look at our challenge. Our challenge is to write down a list of 10 things you want to get or 10 things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Then go down the list and decide whether your wanting has become coveting, right? So you're going to decide if you want these things because you truly want it or because you saw someone have it and you want what they have too. 
or you saw it on the TV and because you saw it, then now, you know what, I think I need this or I want this rather than I actually need it, sorry. Are there things that you want so badly that they are distracting you from more important things? Oh my God. Are you jealous of what others have to the point where you are a little bit angry with them, right? So think about these things, right? Why, when you're going down your list of 10 things, right? Are these things that you want so badly and they're distracting you from important things? Are these things that you're jealous because someone else have them and maybe you're even a bit angry at them because they have them and you don't? Think about them to see if it's things that, you, that you're coveting or if it's things that you really need or what God needs to provide for you, right? Amen. Amen. And so we've looked at quite a number of temptations. You know, the topic again for this morning is a little man with a big heart. But mm -hmm. all of these um, all of these temptations were things that this little man had to overcome. And we see that he overcame them because he trusted in God's word. So we hope for the little kids um, that they will remember what choices to make when it comes to food. When entertainment. It, entertainment, when it comes to cheating, cheating lying, lying, and covetousness or jealousy. Yes, jealousy. wanting what others have. Amen. You know, and so that is um, that is what we, we thought would be helpful for the little kids this morning. And I was blessed because it reminded me so much of how I am still like a child when it comes to these <laughs> temptations, sis. So I am going to go back and I am going to find somewhere to stick this up in my prayer corner to remind myself about these very regular temptations that, um, you know, are difficult for us, but that we can overcome by God's grace. If we trust him, right? Mm -hmm. Once you meet the Savior and we trust him, then we will be able to overcome. Just like Zacchaeus overcame his problem, we will be able to overcome, right? Amen. But just before we get to Zacchaeus, that's the sermon for today. Uh, we want to share a couple announcements uh, with our viewers. Um, and so uh, last week um, or the ending of this week, we've had our youth week, week of prayer. And so I hope that you all enjoyed the program. I was so excited. I saw a lot of our young people. I was so proud of them um, that they could speak so well as it relates to their relationship with God and encourage other young people. Uh, so we just closed our youth week of prayer. I hope everyone had a lovely Global Youth Day. Um, and coming up in at the end of April, April 28th, to May 11th, uh, we're preparing, you know, all of the churches are preparing for what, sis? For our campaigns, right? We're going to do just what we have just finished off in our week of prayer, right? It says you, you go up to your cities, you go and you uplift the fallen. So that is what we're doing. We're, we'll be having three um, ma major campaigns. major campaigns within our cities in different areas of our cities. So um, please keep the, this campaign in prayer. Yes. Keep the team in prayer as they're preparing for it. And... Keep the financing in prayer also Amen. because, of course, Amen. it comes with a financial cost as well, right? And we need to ensure that our people are ready. We need to make sure the communities are ready. So keep the communities in prayer also because we Amen. want people to be able to find the hope we have Amen. in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so if for whatever reason you're, you are a part of a church and you don't know about the campaign and you're not part of a prayer group, you're not part of a, the ushers or you're not part of any of the teams, make sure you go to your, your church elder or your pastor and say, hey, uh, what are you guys doing for the campaign? I need to be a part of the visitation team or put me in the prayer band. Uh, so make sure that you get active and involved in these campaigns that are coming up so that we can do our part to witness to others. Right? Amen. We also want to remind our viewers of our um, weekly daily program. So uh, we, should, we should have the flyers on the screen, but we have our regular um, Bible study with Pastor Davis and Pastor Canole. We have um, our Hour of Power that we will resume next week. We gave the youths their time this week, so we had no Hour of Power um, last week. So we're going to <laughs> Thursday at 6, we're going to have our Hour of Power program. And of course, our weekly Sabbath virtual live worship. So if you want to volunteer to sing a song or to be a part of the lesson study or to even host for a Sabbath school, um, you know, please send your information. If you go on the Facebook page, you can send us a message. We also have our WhatsApp number um, that you can send us a message to say that you would like to be involved. So we're always looking for volunteers to be a part of our program. Okay. Um, we're going to have our message this morning. We're going to go right into it. Um, who is going to be doing the sermon this morning, sis? Oh, this morning we're going to have our 
very own Skylar Vasquez, who will mm -hmm. be presenting our sermon, A Little Man with a Big Heart. And uh, I guess we all just got to listen and be blessed to find out how Mr. Zacchaeus overcame his big problem of sin, right? Amen. Before we hear from Skylar, we're going to have a special meditation song from Joelle and Jace from Biskin Church. Um, and just before them, we're going to close this session um, with prayer. All right. So I'm going to invite you to say a prayer and then I will say a prayer. Sis, we want to pray for our kids. We want to pray for our young people for this 13th Sabbath. We want to pray for the 13th Sabbath offering. We want to pray for the campaigns. Um, and we want to pray for the program that we have here at ETM. So um, I'll, I'll say a prayer and then you'll say a prayer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let us pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful uh, for the privilege of this Sabbath day, Lord. Um, we recognize that this Sabbath was meant for us, for our, or us to renew our relationship with you. And we pray that as we learn to appreciate the Sabbath, that we um, cultivate that appreciation in our children as well, so that they will see the Sabbath as a blessing as an opportunity to spend more time with you, that it is a source of renewal, of excitement, that we look forward to the Sabbath, Lord. And so uh, we thank you for this Sabbath day of rest, and we ask a special prayer for our young children, our kids, our youths, um, that you will be with them um, during this difficult time in the world, Lord, where everything is confusing, where they're faced with so many distractions and temptations, that we will do our part um, to guide them uh, under your instruction, Lord, we pray for our AT and team. We pray for the campaigns, and of course, Lord, we pray for the finance that you will allow this platform to continue the work that it continues to do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Mighty Father God, we ponder a bit longer, Father God, coming humbly before you, Father. Father, you have heard the prayers of Sister Tracy, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, that you may answer them according to your will, Lord. We pray for all our viewers, we pray Amen. for all our children, Lord. Amen. Father God, we pray that you will continue to use our children mightily, Lord Jesus. Help them to know, Lord, that though they are small, Father God, you can still do great things through them, Lord, if they have a willing heart to serve you. Father, we know that sometimes, just like the various situations presented today, we may not be so perfect, Lord Jesus, or sometimes situations may not seem so perfect that happen to us, Lord. But we pray that through you, Lord, that we will trust you and through you we'll be able to overcome them, Lord, and that we'll be able to, to live holy lives for you. Please, Lord Jesus, I, I place into your hands a special or children, Lord, because, Lord, they are the ones who will be charged to carry your message, Lord, and at their critical age, Father God, they, the foundation, the right foundation needs to be built in them, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you impress upon the hearts of adults and parents, Father God, who are around these children, Lord, that they will, Father God, train them the Amen. way you desire them Amen. to be trained, Lord, so that they can grow up to be wonderful boys and girls, wonderful young men and young women for you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the remainder of this program, Lord, with all those who participated and all those who will be participating, Lord. May you bless them and use them. Let them be a vessel for you always. Amen. In just name I pray. Amen. 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 So up next, we have our children's story. We'll have our meditation song by Jolie and Jace. And then we'll have our sermon by Skylar Vasquez. Hi, everyone. It's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called gone fishing. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. It says, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Today's message is I help others learn about Jesus when I follow his example. Have you ever watched people fish? They usually sit very still and wait. Simon Peter had been sitting in his boat all night and had not caught a thing. When Jesus told him to try again, he caught many fish. This is how it may have happened. A cool night breeze blew over the waters of Lake Genesaret. Simon Peter was fishing with his partners, James and John. 
he tossed his big fishing net over the water. He heard a swishing sound and then a splat as it fell. Slowly, slowly, it sank beneath the surface of the water. Simon Peter checked the position of the moon and the stars to tell the time. Soon the sun would be rising, and he still had not caught a single fish. James and John in their own boat weren't catching anything either. In a few minutes, Simon Peter began to haul in the net, hand over hand. He hoped to see the glimmer of fish in the moonlight, but there was nothing. He piled the dripping net into the back of the boat. Then he began to pull on the oars and head back to shore. The sky began to change from black to pink. Simon Peter laid out his net and began to clean it. Jesus was standing on the shore surrounded by a crowd of people. He was telling them how much God loved them. The people really wanted to hear. They crowded so close to Jesus that he stepped into Simon Peter's boat and continued to talk to the people. Simon Peter, no doubt, was happy to share his boat with Jesus. After Jesus finished speaking to the people, he said to Simon Peter, Take your boat out into the deep water, Simon Peter, and let down your nets. Oh, Master, Simon Peter replied, I've been on this lake all night long with James and John, and we didn't catch one fish. He paused and thought for a minute. But if you say so, I will try again. With a swishing sound, the net flew up into the air. It landed with a splat on the water, then sank silently. In a few minutes, Simon Peter began to pull in the net. He could not believe it. The net was full of glimmering, writhing fish. It was so full that the net almost broke. Simon Peter called to James and John, Bring your boat and help me. Soon the floors of both boats were covered with the silvery fish. Piles of fish reached up the sides of the boats and threatened to sink them. When Simon Peter saw all the fish, he knelt before Jesus and said, Leave me, I am a sinful man. But Jesus said, Don't be afraid, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Simon Peter, James, and John dragged their loaded boats up onto the sand and left them there. They turned away from the biggest catch of their lives and left all behind to follow Jesus. They would serve him as long as they lived. And many people would learn of Jesus because of their work. They were truly fishers of men. of the Lord and come surround us who fear him and he delivers them. Psalm 34 verse 7. Teen with a Mission Nathan was six years old when his family returned home to India after serving as missionaries in Lebanon. He was a small boy and didn't have any interest in missionaries or mission work. But things changed when Nathan was 12. He became fascinated by the children's mission stories that he heard Sabbath after Sabbath in church. Soon he began to read old copies of the children's mission quarterly and sometimes even the youth and adult mission quarterly. As he read the stories, he longed to do something for God. He thought, if God can use children the same age as me and even younger, why can't he use me as a missionary? A year passed, two years passed, three years passed. Nathan was 15 and he still felt like he hadn't done anything for God in mission. Then the COVID-19 pandemic shut down India for months. Nathan's father was a pastor and at the request of parents, organized an online Bible study group for teens stuck at home during the lockdown. The online group quickly grew to 15 teens and a number of little children under 10 also joined in. Then Nathan heard his father tell his mother, 
the smaller ones aren't fitting in. The group has two distinct levels of learning. As Nathan lay in bed that night, he felt impressed to start a Bible group for the younger children. At breakfast, he shared his thoughts with his parents. They welcomed the idea and encouraged him to start right away. Nathan excitedly looked through the home library for materials. He decided that each meeting, he would read a Bible story from Arthur Maxwell's The Bible Story and lead a short Bible study from Linda Coe's God Loves Me 28 Ways. God blessed the efforts. Soon children were joining the Bible group from around the neighborhood and even other parents on parts of India. Up to 12 children joined each weekly meeting. Nathan enjoyed leading the Bible group. He felt like God was finally using him for a mission, but he longed to do something more. As COVID-19 restrictions were being lifted about a year later, he heard a sermon about a terminally ill girl who prayed for friends, neighbors, and even missionaries in faraway lands. The preacher said the girl prayed for only three months, but she died but her prayers made a big difference in many lives. Nathan thought, I also should pray. I can pray for my classmates, friends, and the teens in my neighborhood. Classes were resuming at the Seventh-day Adventist where Nathan studied, and many of his classmates belonged to non-Christian religions. Nathan wondered who to pray for. He decided to pray for those who seemed to be the most open to Christianity. They seem to be more fertile soil. Nathan noticed that one boy, Aaron, who enjoyed singing at morning worship and listened attentively to worship talks. He began praying for Aaron. One day, he said to Aaron, I'm happy that you are interested in Christian things. Aaron smiled broadly. I love singing these songs, he said. Long ago, I accepted Jesus as one of my gods. Nathan wanted to know more. Why did your parents choose this Christian school for you? He asked. We live on a farm out in the country, he said. The only school bus that comes close to our house is the Adventist school bus. The conversation started a special friendship between Nathan and Aaron. Whenever possible, Nathan told him about his love for Jesus. He prayed that those seeds would bear fruit. While Nathan spoke about Jesus with Aaron, Another boy named Jai was enthusiastically telling classmates about the power and goodness of the gods that he worshipped. Jai was zealous for his family's faith and he wore ritual makings, markings on his forehead every day. Jai even spoke to Nathan about his gods. Nathan decided not to pray for Jai. Then one day, Nathan played the keyboard at worship and Jai was impressed with his skill. He praised Nathan and asked if he would play a song for his own religion on the keyboard. Politely, Nathan said, I'm sorry, I only play Christian music. Jai didn't say anything more to Nathan for several months. Nathan kept praying for his other classmates and rejoiced as he saw God touching hearts. Then one day, Jai came over to Nathan and abruptly said, Teach me the Lord's Prayer. Nathan couldn't believe his ears. Jai hadn't seemed like, like fertile soil worth praying for. But here he was, asking to learn the Lord's Prayer. Nathan began sharing his love for Jesus with Jai. As time passed, he noticed that Jai stopped talking about his gods. Sometimes, he even came to school without the markings on his forehead. Our Lord has moved Jai from being an opposer to a searcher of truth, Nathan said. I believe that it won't be long before Jai finds the truth and surely the truth will set him free. Nathan is confident that God is using him for a mission and he is praying to do even more. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offering today that will help spread the gospel in India and Nepal. Seven of the 10 13th Sabbath Arm um, projects involve Adventist schools like the one where Nathan studies. Thank you for your generous offering.
You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. little man with a big heart. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, please help me to share your word today. I pray that the message will change us and make us more like you. Please help us all to listen and learn. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have you ever been to a parade but you couldn't see because if of the person in front of you being too tall? It is no fun to go to a parade if you can't see. The marching bands and different floats passing by. Maybe if you have a stool to stand on, or even if one of your parents would lift you on their shoulder, you would be able to see. Being at a taller point, being taller or being at a ta taller point would be the solution to see the parade. Today's Bible story is about a man who went to a parade but couldn't see because he was just short. The main attraction in this parade was Jesus. He had become famous because he had performed many miracles. He had risen Lazarus from the dead, and he has restored, restored sight to a blind man named Bartimaeus. So when he entered the city of Jericho, everyone was super, super excited to meet or even see him. People lined the, the streets, hoping to get a glimpse of Jesus. One of, one of the person in the crowd was a man who was, was 
very short. He was so short that he couldn't see above all the people in the crowd. You probably know this man name. Yes, that's right. It was Zacchaeus. He didn't have a stool or worse anyone to lift him on their on their shoulder to help him he saw he see above the crowd but he really wanted to see jesus as luke 19 1 to 4 say so he got desperate and climbed a sycamore tree and waited for jesus to pass by as jesus traveled through the streets as Jesus traveled through the city of Jericho, he came to the place where Zacchaeus sat up on a limb in the tree. As Luke 19, 9, 19, 5 to 6 says, Jesus stopped, looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I for I am going to your house today. The people in the crowd was shocked. Zacchaeus was one of the most hated men in Jericho. Why did people hate him? Zacchaeus was a little man with a big problem. He was a thief and a cheat. He was the chief tax collector. And he had become very, very rich because he cheated people by collecting more taxes than their own just so that he could keep some for himself. The people couldn't, be couldn't believe that Jesus would go to the home of a man like this. Zacchaeus knew that he had cheated people and when he met Jesus, he felt bad for, for all the things he had done and wanted to make it right. Zacchaeus repented. He was sorry for what he had done. As Luke 19, 8 says, he said to Jesus, I'm going to give half of all I own to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll please. Play about four times the amount. What I mean by four times the amount? The amount, if if he collect two hundred and the tax of a one hundred and fifty from the person, it go times it by four, and that will equal to eight hundred. Zacchaeus was sorry for what he had done, and repented. As Luke 19, 9 says, Jesus forgave him and said, Today salvation has come to this house. Look. Yes, Zacchaeus was a little man with a big problem, sin that all of us have. But he met Jesus and his life was changed. He now was a little man with a big heart. The story of Zacchaeus is also our story for today. Today, we all have our own weaknesses. When we, when we become aware and accept our weaknesses, we can then overcome them if we repent. And surrender them to Jesus. Jesus knows about our situations and he wants to save us. Just as Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It doesn't matter if you are short or tall. When we meet Jesus, he will change, change your life too. This is what happened to Zacchaeus, and this is what can happen to all of us too. It is in our smallest 
that God can reveal his greatness. All we need to do is to welcome him in our hearts and let his spirit lead us and change us. In our hearts, do you know that they have a song for Zacchaeus? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, please help us to make our wrongs right. Help us to allow you in our hearts so that you can do great things through us. Help us to grow closer to you so that we can be honest, kind, and true. And much more, just like you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And there you have it. A little man with a big, big heart. heart. I don't know if that describes Zacchaeus or that describes Skyler. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it describes both because it describes all of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially... Um, when we are looking at kids, because it's 13th Sabbath program, right? They're Amen. small, but they have big hearts, right? And you know what? Though we are small, though they are small, I keep on saying we because I'm I'm taking myself as a child. Amen. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> though though they are small, they tend to still have a problem of sin, as we've seen in today's program, right? Either um, whether they're they're fighting with these various decisions to make or mm -hmm. not. Um, but they have a problem, right? All the kids, it's, it's the story of Zacchaeus, like Skylar said, is our story, right? The kids' Amen. story, the adult story, it's all of our story, right? We all have a problem, but when we meet Jesus, Jesus has that amazing power to change us transform. and to transform yes. us, right? And with him, if we trust him, we can overcome our big problem of sin and we can get a big loving heart. We see Zacchaeus Amen. got a big loving heart. He wanted to make his, his wrongs right by now sharing what he had wrongfully gained from others to now share with, with those who are poor Amen. and those who he had cheated, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with us, right? We can all have a big heart. <laughs> so I hope that this program was transformative for you, um, for all of our viewers, because it certainly was for me. And like you said, all of us can see ourselves in the story of Zacchaeus. We're all little people trying to love God until he gives us a big heart. All right, so we hope you enjoyed this program. And of course, we want to close out with our closing song from our praise team, our kids' praise team from um, Biscayne and Nativeville Sinai. So we hope you enjoyed this program and don't leave without uh, joining us for our closing song. This little man, this the light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This the light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let it and blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let it and blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let it and blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Shine over Billy's, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all over Billy's, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all over Billy's, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. As a non-profit organization, the Adventist Television Network solely relies on your financial support. By partnering with us through a monthly donation, you will help us to continue to fulfill the mission in taking the gospel into all the world. For more information, please call 613-9351 or email us at atnfin.com cbm.beliesunion.org Thank you for your prayers and support of the ATN ministry and together we may hasten the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.